Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. Yes, I'm Gary Machida, and you have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, where uh, we train to be able to explain, defend, share our Catholic faith with anybody we meet with charity, clarity, and confidence. And it's great to be with you today. Got an awesome show in store for you. In fact, uh, our guest today is a hero of mine, uh, someone who I have admired over the years and... uh, just been an awesome pro-life uh, advocate fighter, uh, not only in the public arena, but also academically. It's none other than Dr. Janet Smith is going to be joining us. And, uh, of course, you know, when I, uh, <laughs> if you had a choice to uh, interview your hero, you, you know, what do you want to talk about? I, of course, I'm going to want to talk about uh, one of her most fantastic uh areas of expertise, and that is in the area of contraception, which is uh, something that the world just doesn't understand, doesn't fathom. You know, why is artificial contraception wrong? Uh, well, NFP, natural family planning, is okay. And also, why? I mean, what's so immoral about uh, using artificial contraceptives? Well, uh, Dr. Janice Smith, I think better than anybody that I've heard, um, really has awesome argument to help explain that to non-Catholics, to people who are thoroughly secular, and and give some compelling arguments for the truth of the Church's teaching on this controversial issue. And it's not only controversial as far as uh, those outside the Church, but it's also controversial for those inside the Church, those that really haven't been catechized and really haven't heard a good defense of the Catholic Church's teaching. So I'm going to I'm going to bring her on. We're going to talk about what's the difference between artificial contraception and natural family planning. We also hopefully can get to how you can help share and explain and show uh, the beauty of the church's teaching on this issue. So I am super fired up to have her on. Uh, They'll be coming after the first break. And as always, we do our critical thinking skills. You know, we build up those, (laughs) our neurons, you know, get them all firing in the correct order so that we can think critically about a lot of the information that we get out there. And also, we also learn a little bit about church history. And to do that, we have our Finding the Fallacy and the Meet the Early Church Fathers segments. Today's Finding the Fallacy, by the way, is none other than the very popular Argumentum ad Populum. In other words, the argument to the popular. And we are going to meet an early church father today who is not necessarily an individual, but a group of writings known as the Apostolic Constitution. So good things in store for us today. Lots to talk about. And as always, you are part of the program. So give us a call, 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Love to hear from you. Or perhaps you have a question for Dr. Smith. Um, also, you can send us your emails at questions at hands on We, uh, those go directly to the sensei's mailbox where I try to, uh, answer every single one I get. And even sometimes uh, a few of them make it on the air. So good stuff. And it's also time for me to give my shout outs to welcome all you watching live stream on social media, namely Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Great to see familiar names there, and uh, <laughs> and also it's great for you. Uh, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio, on your Catholic radio show uh, station, excuse me, Catholic radio stations, and also maybe you're listening via podcast. All are welcome here, all different media. We'd love to uh, you join us and do this thing that we call hands-on apologetics. All right, so without further ado then, why don't we jump to our finding the fallacy segment 
And the finding of the fallacy, like I said, is the popular argument of the argumentum ad populum, namely the argument to the people or to the populace. Uh, let's see. What is it? Well, basically, it's a fallacious argument that concludes uh, that a proposition must be true because many or most people believe it. In other words, you could basically say, if many people believe so, then it must be so. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the fallacy, the wrong thinking of the argument to the people. In other words, an appeal to the majority. And uh, <laughs> it's funny how many of these fallacies, uh, if you're a parent, how many you've already encountered, you probably just didn't know the Latin term for it. How many times have you had your kids say, well, everybody's doing it. Why is it wrong? Well, that's a fallacy of the argument to, uh, to the people or the argumentum ad populum. It also, by the way, goes in, into uh, many other things. It's, it could be called appeal to the masses, appeal to belief, appeal to the majority, appeal to democracy, appeal to popularity, uh, argument by consensus, consensus fallacy, uh, lots of many different names. In fact, it has a um, kinship with a uh, propaganda technique known as the bandwagon fallacy, which basically is kind of, you know, join the crowd. And although, it, obviously, if you think about it logically, it doesn't make sense because uh, just because a lot of people believe something to be true doesn't mean it's true. Uh, but um, but it does appeal to some sort of uh, innate desire for us to be part of the crowd, you know, to not be a singular nut on the fringe. We'd rather be a nut you know, surrounded by other nuts, I guess. Uh, and so the, the argument to the popular, you know, the, I think that's really where its strength or its weight is, is because it plays on that emotional desire for us to fit in, to be with other people to uh, kind of mainstream stuff because no one likes to be on the fringes. So that is our finding the fallacy for today, the argumentum ad populum, otherwise known in English as the argument to the people. All right. Why don't we jump into our Meet the Early Father segment, and today's Early Father is the Apostolic Constitutions, which is written roughly around 8400. So it's a little late, you know, later in the uh, corpus of uh, early church father writings. And the so-called apostolic constitutions or the constitutions of the holy apostles by Clement is basically a very interesting work in terms of history. In eight books, that is, the lar- it is the largest extent collection of legislative and liturgical m- material at, at such an early date. Okay, so it's a huge cache of many different documents that fit under this title. The work uh, pretends to be of apostolic origin, and it's written out and sent around to all the bishops and priests by supposedly St. Clement of Rome, who, as you know, is an apostolic father. We talked about that, uh, uh, him on our show. Uh, but in that, in that respect, it's actually a forgery. It's not a legitimate uh, document from St. Clement of Rome. Rather, the person put the name on there, as a literary device and and deliberately uh, to lend credence to these documents. So just FYI, you know, it might be called apostolic constitutions, but uh, it's apostolicity is doubt worthy. And it's divided into three parts. And uh, let's go some of the parts. First part is books one through six, which is a revised version of another work known as the Dediscalia of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, which was written in uh, the beginning to the mid-3rd century. Uh, most of the Apostolic Constitutions basically is this work, the Didascalia being reworked. Um, let's see, and the Didascalia prescribes fasting uh, during Holy Week, whereas the Constitutions actually prescribe fasting through the whole of Lent, all 40 days. Part 2, uh, the whole book of uh, 7, uh, book 7, excuse me, is divided into two sections. The first section is an enlargement on another apostolic father known as the Didache, or the Teaching of the Twelve. The second section is a collection of prayers, of praise and thanksgiving, instructions for catechumen, administration of baptism. Uh, it catalogs bishops consecrated by the apostles. Uh, all sorts of interesting information. And the third and probably the most valuable part of the work is its final book, Book 8, uh, which has deals with charisms, uh, 
about ordinations, blessings, uh, some legal prescriptions. And finally, in Chapter 47 of the uh, Apostolic Constitutions, um, it's uh, a work of pseudo uh, Clement, known as the Apostolic Canons, or the 85 so-called Apostolic Canons. Um, and uh, Chapter 6 through 15 contain an entire so-called Clementine Liturgy the oldest extent complete text of the mass. So uh, it's a huge collection of works, and uh, some of them are just reworkings of uh, some uh, writings from the apostolic period, like the Didache. Some of it's reworkings of later documents, like Didascalia. But it also has some very interesting things in terms of liturgy and teachings of catechumen. Um, So it has a lot of info. Uh, but again, you know, the problem is, is really not even the, what it claims to be, namely the apostolic constitution. It doesn't come from the apostles. So the work in its present form uh, cannot be earlier than the year uh, 341 AD uh, because 28 of the 85 uh, apostolic canons at the end had been extracted from a, a synod of Antioch of that year. So in other words, obviously it couldn't have... Uh, predicted <laughs> that, that several hundred years later there would be a council in Antioch that would give the same canons. So obviously it, it can't be earlier than 341 A.D. Uh, and it's most probably, uh, most scholars put the entire work of the apostolic constitutions around the year 400. So in terms of, uh, you know, its uh, contents and, and what the ap- apostles taught, not very valuable. But as far as what Christians believed in the 5th century, very valuable. Lots of info. So that is our Meet the Early Church Father for today, the Apostolic Constitutions. Coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to chat with Dr. Janet Smith about contraception. Why not? Stay tuned, everybody. This is Terry Barber reminding you, there's a women's conference coming up September 7, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity, be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. In Luke 7, Jesus said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven her because she has been shown great love. According to St. John of the Cross, Christians should always remember that the value of their good works is not based on number and excellence. Their value is based on the love for God that prompts them to do the works. May we always be motivated by true love for God and not worry so much about what we do, but why we do it. selling your home or your business property this is terry barber real estate for life underwrites the terry and jesse show and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world and when they receive their referral fee they will give 80 percent of it to a pro-life organization wow that's 80 percent real estate for life.org 877-LIFE-US-1 Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And, uh, you know, uh, there are many different teachings of the church that uh, today people outside the church just don't understand. In fact, they outright reject. And as Catholic apologists, we need to be able to give an answer uh, for the hope that's in us and explain why the church teaches what it does and why everybody should uh, embrace Catholicism. And so uh, there's many different, very contentious issues, uh, such as abortion and other ethical issues. But one issue that's out there that I think a lot of Catholics simply don't understand, and therefore they're not really not equipped to share and defend the faith on, is the church's teaching concerning artificial contraception, uh, how artificial contraception is different from NFP, things like that. Well, to help work us through this, uh, I have a, a guest that I, I've admired for a number of years, and that is Dr. Janet Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith has taught philosophy for nine years at the University of Notre Dame in a program of liberal studies. She went on to teach philosophy for 12 years at the University of uh, Dallas, and she came right here to the Midwest at Sacred Heart Major Seminary back in 2001. And as of 2016, she held the Father Michael J. McGivney Chair in Life Issues. And she just recently retired this year. Uh, she's a prolific author and speaker. And Dr. Janet Smith, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Glad to be here. Well, yeah, it's... Uh, the pleasure is all mine to tell you. I've been, uh, you've been a hero of mine over the years, and uh, <laughs> and so this is kind of well, a dream come so true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I always find that, uh, imp- you know, it's it's flattering, but I know myself, so it's always like, what do I do with that? Just say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? That's just encouragement to keep up the great work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Uh, one area that you are uh, secure any part out there is area that in the interest so people we don't uh, Catholics many of us don't even know that the church has any teaching less of what it is maybe it's there well it, it interests people to know that all Christian churches were opposed to contraception until 1930. And it was the Anglican Church for the first time that broke with this unbroken tradition, not for any good theological reasons. You know, just hearing from spouses about how hard it was to have large families and saying, well, then, okay, in those instances, um, contraception might be morally permissible. Uh, The Catholic Church, at that time, Pius XII put out a beautiful document, Pius XI, uh, Costi Canubii, and just a gorgeous document on marriage and and contraception. And then there was virtually no debate within the church about the topic until the late 1950s when there was uh, word was coming out the contraceptive pill was being invented and that it was going to allow spouses to uh, control their family size without using a condom or a diaphragm, which were basically a withdrawal which were the methods of contraception up to that point of birth control, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so people were excited about that and thought maybe it would be okay for Catholics to use it because, again, it didn't interrupt the spontaneity of the sexual act. But the, so that was, the pill was really invented in late 19, what, 58, 59 or so. And so right around that time, 1960 or so, John the Twenty Third set up a, a special commission Look into the issue, and when not to not to reconsider the church's teaching, but to determine how the church could teach its teaching in a changing modern world uh, that believed there was overpopulation, and now we had this thing called the pill that clearly the UN and other places were really going to be pushing uh, in, with the concern about overpopulation. Mm-hmm. And so, in 1968, Pope Paul VI put out the document Humanae Vitae, uh, which just reaffirmed what the church's teaching had always been on contraception, which was basically was not in accord with God's plan for sexuality, that God had two purposes for sex. One was to permit a man and a woman to become one and to greatly affirm each other and proclaim that they wanted to be one in a sense of going forth together in this world um, as a unit, helping each other um, 
expressing their love for each other, affirming each other, and that it should be open to children, and that they are meant to, the gift of sexuality is meant to help God actually bring forth new human souls. He wants human souls. He made the whole universe uh, for human souls so that we would be able to spend an eternity with him. So it's a beautiful thing that God made love the way that new life, um, making love is the way that babies are made. It's a beautiful thing. And so uh, it's always been the church's teaching. And it, it's a, it, in 1960, again, when there were, there were, the culture was rapidly becoming a contraceptive culture because Protestants had accept, accepted contraception and pressure on Catholics to, to do it. But some 66% of Catholics in 1960 had never contracepted. By the time it, uh, by the time of 1970 or so, well over 90 percent of Catholics had, had had contracepted. Wow, yeah, boy, that's that's a huge change. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, now, how was um, how was the uh, Humanae Vitae received in the church? Very poorly. Um, well, the the one problem was that this commission that John Paul this John the Twenty Third had set up was composed of only six priests, moral theologians. And after he died, Pope Paul VI put 66 people on it, um, lay people almost entirely, uh, the people in charge of family life offices, uh, doctors, demographers, social workers. And they again, their mandate was to consider how the church should te- teach its teaching in the modern world. But somewhere along the line, they decided to change their mandate um, to whether the church could and should change its teaching. And when Pope Paul VI got wind of that, he was encouraged by by some members of the commission to close it down and said, uh, you've got a runaway commission on your hands. And he said, well, I want to give them free reign to do their work. Um, and he, but he put 15 new people on the commission who were cardinals, not archbishops, and bishops and made them the only voting members. The commission really never truly commit, completed its work, but it, it wrapped up its work and uh, sent various documents to Paul VI. But it was very clear that of that 15 voting, voting members, nine voted that, yes, the church could and should change its teaching. Three said no, and three abstained. Hmm. Well, that was supposed to be just an advisory commission to the Holy Father. It wasn't in any way a deliberative commission, and it – had taken upon itself to ask and answer a question he hadn't put to them. But the Catholic press got hold of that. Some people from the inside of that commission leaked the documents, which were for the eyes of the Holy Father only, uh, leaked it to the Catholic press in 1967. And th- there was this just this up- uproar that the Catholic Church was going to change its teaching. Look, 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 the commission wants the church to change its teaching. And they were really putting pressure on Pope Paul VI, but he really agonized uh, and actually called, consulted Carol Wojtyla, the future John Paul II, hmm. and who was also on that commission but never got to meet with the commission but wrote various documents uh, in response to the commission, altogether supportive of the church's teaching. And he wrote him on Evita. He asked at the time that the bishops of the world – supported statements, and most of them did, but some of them were lukewarm, and some of them had sort of loopholes that you could drive a Mack truck through. So uh, very quickly, uh, dissent became the coin of the realm. Uh, Major theologians, one in particular relevant to us is uh, Charles Curran, who was a moral theologian at the Catholic University of America, and virtually within 24 hours of Humanae Vitae being issued, he stood on the steps of Catholic University and announced that Catholics did not need to live by this teaching, uh, that it was based on an inadequate notion of natural law, and before long the church would change its teaching. Well, his his view was then basically taught in seminaries, in universities, and it was accepted that before long the church would have to uh, give in to the pressures of the modern world and accept contraception. So it, for decades and decades, it got very little support, uh, to say the least. Uh, those who were the teachers of the, in fact, the major theologians teaching in, in pontifical academies in Rome uh, taught against the teaching. And they were the teachers of the teachers, of the priests that will go back and teach in seminaries and major Catholic universities. So Catholic priests were basically taught in seminary from about 1970 onwards that they should not bother um, – 
you know, disturb the consciences of Catholic couples. And if they thought it was morally permissible for them to contracept, they could. But John Paul II, and the Holy Spirit didn't like that. So the Holy Spirit um, made sure that John Paul II was elected Pope in 1978. And it had been a major theme of his life was um, to explain the church's teaching on um, on sexuality, and particularly its teaching on contraception. He had done that in his early priesthood days in the 1950s, and in his when he became a bishop, when he became an archbishop, and then when he became pope. He'd written an incredible book in 1959 called Love and Responsibility, which is a philosophical defense of the church's teaching. It's brilliant. And then before he became Holy Father, he'd finished off um, Theology of the Body, which is a scriptural and theological defense of the church's teaching. And he promoted it wherever he went. Uh, and I think he made a little dent, a little dent in um, what's been taught. Uh, Catholics have really uh, been very affected by the theology of the body. Christopher West uh, has done a marvelous job uh, popularizing the teaching. So I think you have a greater percentage of Catholics accepting the uh, teaching now, priests accepting teaching now uh, than we did back, than we ever have. I think we're sort of at a high point, and I hope it continues. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's good news because, uh, boy, it couldn't get much lower <laughs> back in the seventies and eighties. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so. Uh, so we're headed in the right direction. Uh, well, we're coming up to our first break, and the other side of the break, Doctor, I, I want to ask you to uh, explain. You know, how does natural family planning differ from artificial mm-hmm. contraception? And then maybe if you could give us some tips on. Uh, you know, how to explain to someone who's outside the church and, you know, really doesn't understand uh, why the church has any problems with artificial contraception. You know, what we could do as Catholics to, to kind of persuade them in the right direction. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. All right. Excellent. Well, yes. well, uh, well uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with Dr. Janet Smith uh, and uh, about, you know, like I said, one of the thorniest issues that uh, confront us Catholics today is... Uh, you know, ethics and especially sexuality. And uh, let's see. Actually, I, I came up a little short on the break. We still got a few more seconds. Uh, but, um, well, actually, uh, maybe I could ask you a quick question. Um, does the church permit, uh, you know, uh, oh, boy, I'm messing up on time. See, I am in awe of you that <laughs> I lost my faculty please. of timekeeping. Oh, All right. Now, we, now I do hear it. No, I, now I do hear the music. Okay, we're talking with Dr. Janet Smith on contraception. Stay tuned, folks. This is Hands-On Apologetics. More to come on the other side of the break. This is Barbara Nicolosi, and we're having a women's conference here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina on September 7th, 2019. This is going to be a great, great day for you to come and meet a bunch of new friends, wonderful Catholic women who want to deepen their Catholic faith and their understanding of themselves as women. You know, this era right now that we're in, so much confusion. What is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? You know, the Catholic Church has a lot to say about this, and we're going to hear about them. We're going to hear about John Paul II's letter on women that he wrote from Mary Danielle Barber. is going to talk about that. She's going to talk about Mary as a model for all of us. It's a topic that we can never reflect on too much. I'm going to talk about Teresa of Avila and the interior castle and how a mystical marriage is what all of us should be called to, or are called to as Catholics in our prayer lives, and especially as women in the church. Aileen Blakowski is going to talk about motherhood and homeschooling. And then Father, we have, uh, finally we have Father Charles Murray. He's going to be the celebrant of the Eucharist. He's going to be here hearing confessions. It's going to be an amazing day. We're going to have an hour of adoration together, time to pray, time to laugh, to eat, reflect, uh, grow in our passion for our Catholic faith and our identity as Catholic women. You don't want to miss it. You want to come. You want to bring your friends. You want to bring your daughters, your nieces. That's really an affordable day. So go to 
virginmostpowerfulradio.org and you can register for this conference or call 877-526-2151. The Women's Conference is going to be a great event for the Archdiocese of, of Los Angeles area, Southern California Catholics. You don't want to miss it. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Dr. Janet Smith about contraception. Why not? And uh, Dr. Smith, uh, people say, you know, there's lots of misconceptions about Catholicism that, well, because the church condemns artificial contraception, that means Catholics just uh, are supposed to have as many children as they can. There's no boundaries. Or they might even say, well, you have Catholic, you have natural family planning, and, and that's pretty much the same thing as, as the pill anyway. So there's really no difference. How would you answer that? Well, first of all, if there's no difference, again, just why don't people use NFP? <laughs> yes. And then people say, <laughs> they would say it make all the difference in the world. They say it make completely yeah. different. And you ask them how, why, how it would be different. They say, well, we'd have to practice abstinence, and we don't want to. And then they say, um, we'd have to trust God more. They actually say those words, we have to trust God more, which is very interesting. I want to say, say yeah, it makes a huge difference. All right. In, in, both of those things are true. <laughs> both of those <laughs> things are true. Those are good, those are good things, not bad things. Um, first of all, they have to look into that. I mean, this is not the church's major concern, but it's, it's a consequence of what contraception is. We have to first understand that God made the world and said it was good. God made the human body and said that it was good. God made fertility and said that it was good. All right, it's good to be a fertile human being, not bad. And so when we're using contraceptives, we're basically saying there's something wrong with our bodies. Our bodies can get pregnant, and that's not a good thing. You say there's nothing wrong with fertility is a healthy condition. Having babies is a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, obviously, you can be in a position where another pregnancy is not welcome. Um, that, that's certainly possible. But God has given us many ways of doing things. Um, you know, we could, for instance, <laughs> if you want to diet, that's oftentimes not a good idea to, to lose weight. Well, there's many ways you can do that. You can exercise. You can, can be very um, mindful of your eating habits. Or you could practice bulimia. You could eat and throw up. Mm-hmm. Say, well, wait a second. That's a violation of the body. That's doing something vicious to the body. You say, no, you have to use good means, means that respect the body, or ways that respect the way that the body works. Exercise and dieting are very good things. Bulimia is a very bad thing. Yes, you'll lose weight, but it's a very bad thing. Anorexia is a very bad thing. It's a disease. These are diseases. So I want to say, filling your body with um, alien hormones uh, that um, prevent your fertility is an assault on something that's healthy. And there are all sorts of bad physical side effects of any one of the chemical hormone uh, uh, contraceptives. Women are more and more discovering that. There's a marvelous website called Natural Womanhood, Natural Womanhood, that will explain how NFP works and what are the dangers of all the various forms of, of contraceptives. Natural family planning completely respects a woman body body. It's not an assault on a woman's body. It's not saying there's something deficient about a woman's body. It's saying God designed the body well. He gave a woman a window of the month where she can get pregnant and other windows of the month where she cannot possibly get pregnant. Most women don't know that she that they ovulate, honestly, only once a month. And this, they know that, but they don't know that the egg lives for only 24 hours in their body and can be fertilized for only 12 of those 24 hours. Now, it's a little more complicated because women secrete a certain kind of mucus that keeps the, the, the semen or sperm alive, keeps the sperm alive, and uh, can be, do that for five days, um, up to five days. So a woman can have, five, can have intercourse five days before she ovulates and get pregnant on the day that she ovulates. That's very rare. It's 3%. 
but it can happen. So most women, and, but if she doesn't get pregnant, if she doesn't get pregnant, that egg dies uh, quite immediately, again, within 24 hours of ovulation. She can't get pregnant for the rest of the month. Absolutely impossible. There's no egg there to be fertilized. So what, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if a woman could uh, identify what are the days of the month where she might get pregnant? And if it were not a good idea to get pregnant, get pregnant, it's clear that it would be a good idea to abstain during that time. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. If you abstain, you can't get pregnant. You know, If you know what those days are, don't have sex during those days. It seems like God would pat you on the head and say, smart, smart. Um, and so you have this intelligent way of a healthy way, sort of a econ- environmentally safe way of um, ecologically respectful of a woman's body. And the absence, even though it's difficult, much like dieting is difficult, budgeting is difficult, exercising regularly is, is a challenge, so is abstinence. It's a challenge. But most people say over the long haul, it has a great um, benefit on their marriage, that they come to understand that, that sex is not just for pleasure um, and that sex is a part of their relationship. That means building a family, uh, expressing a commitment to each other, and that uh, abstinence is a part of that picture. It makes them realize that a woman does not, does not need to be sexually available all the time for her husband to love her. Uh, it, 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 the most amazing thing is couples who use natural family planning almost never divorce. Right? The best we can find is the divorce rate is around 2%, whereas the rest of the culture is, is divorcing over 50%. That in itself should be a huge selling factor. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. In fact, yeah, you kind of segued into my next question was, you know, it, when we're dialoguing with non-Catholics, uh, I think the the goods that come out of NFP and also the, the down points of artificial contraception, I think that is more persuasive than, uh, you know, appealing to natural theology. Um, would you agree? And and if so, what would well, you they, say? Those are, part, they're, those are all a part of nat- what we call natural law, um, yeah. which means that you have to treat things in accord with their nature. And that's what natural law means. And the nature of the human being is that we're a creature of God and that we should use our bodies as he designed them to be used. And that's that's the basics of natural law. And when you, when you don't use the body, it's designed to be used or treated, uh, there's going to be disastrous consequences. Uh, we've seen the disastrous consequences of contraception that permits sex outside of marriage. And you have all these babies that are born who are then aborted. You have women who become single mothers for the rest of their lives. You have baby, children who are raised in a household where they virtually never see their fathers. You say that those are very um, um, kind of direct consequences of contraception. It makes people think it makes sense to have sex without being married and not being prepared for a child. And John Paul II says that the very bottom line for sexual ethics is that you know that sex leads to babies. We all know that. Sex leads to babies. Just keep saying that. Sex leads to babies. Second refrain, if you're not ready for babies, you are not. You shouldn't have sex unless you're ready for babies. You shouldn't have sex unless you're ready for babies. How many women have babies even though they were using some contraception? I've heard women say, that's my condom baby, that's my IUD baby, that's my pill baby, All right? Contraceptives fail. Sex leads to babies. You're not ready for babies until you're married. You're not ready for babies until you're married. These are sort of things we should, you know, drum into people's, young people's heads from day one. When, when they're small children, mothers should be saying to their children, I, you know, your little brother, I just love him, this baby, I love him. I, I, my, my life would be horrible without him. But it takes a lot of work, and you're not ready for babies until you're married. I need my husband. I need your father to help me take care of these babies. And um, kids should never be confused about that, that you shouldn't have sex until you're married because sex leads to babies. I think that's, that's a, a, a a common sense position, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you should be able to see easily. Then those of us who believe in God and believe that sex is a great gift from God, we desperately want to find out what God's will is for our sexuality. I don't yeah. think that's hard to find out. God loves babies. God loves souls. He wants to populate heaven with souls. And again, it doesn't mean you have to have as many as your, your body can bear. It means you have to raise as many as you can raise well. 
you know, that you can raise well. You can you won't be exceedingly tired. You won't be irritable. You won't be worn down. You have enough money to, to you know, provide a decent level of lifestyle and, and education. And so all those factors have to be taken into account. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, in fact, it, it's amazing how uh, contraception has changed the whole meaning of uh you know, sex and marriage that uh, for in the modern mind, especially among the youth, there's no connection between sex, marriage and babies. I mean, it's just uh, they're completely <laughs> separate ideas as if, you know, one doesn't, you know, involve the other. No, that's what exactly what con- has been the, 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 the most or, or most damage that contraception has done has made us think that having sex, having babies and being married are not necessarily connected. Yeah, and uh, so people people have been making their decisions as, about sex as though it makes sense to have sex before marriage. You need to try it out. You need to cohabit ahead of time. And there's virtually no evidence on the face of the earth that cohabitation improves your chances of having a good marriage. In fact, just the opposite. Those who cohabit divorce at a higher rate than those who don't. And along with lasting marriages, predictably are by those who have not had sex before marriage, have remained virgins before marriage. They've had a really strong understanding of the purpose of sex, and they don't believe in divorce either most of the time, but neither do those who contracept. They don't generally don't much, they don't want it. They don't want to get divorced, and nonetheless they do, where those who are virgins before marriage and don't contracept almost never get divorced. That should be the biggest selling point imaginable, because the one thing I find with young people and when I'm talking about whether premarital sex is wrong and the morality of contraception, mm-hmm. they hate divorce. They hate it. Whether it's happened in their family or in a friend's family or in a cousin's family, they hate it. They know their, their hearts are broken. Their parents are, their father's not living at home anymore or their friend's father's not at home anymore. They can't see them on the weekends. They can't go places. They can't, in every way, it puts a damper on people's lives. Mom and dad are fighting. Mom and dad hate each other. Did dot dad like because he hated me? If God, if God, dad really loved me, he would have stayed. Maybe he didn't like mom, but why would he leave me just because he doesn't like mom? And that's what what young people naturally think. They may not, they may not be able to express those things to their parents, so they very very much don't want to get divorced. They don't want to cause that pain to their own children. And so the church knows how uh, the best the best lifestyle to have to do the best you can make it to be so that you don't get divorced. And that's don't have sex before marriage. And in mar- with marriage, don't contracept. Go to church, worship the Lord, stay married, love your spouse, work on your marriage. There you go. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Derek. All right. That's Dr. Dr. Janet Smith, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'll give you more information where you can get more of this stuff. Stay tuned. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app for him. I went on vacation, and, you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an on-fire Catholic, and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. This is Terry Barber reminding you 
There's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity, be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, Hands-On Apologetics, folks. And, yeah, that boy, what a great segment. Uh, yeah, Dr. Smith had a, another engagement she needed to go to, but nevertheless, some great gems in terms of uh, defending and explaining this teaching that we really need to let people know because... It helps people. It's good for people. That's that's the beautiful thing about Christ and his church is that church teachings are beneficial. <laughs> they help people. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, you have to do this because it's hard. You should do it because it's good. You know, it's what our creator wanted. And I wanted to give, uh, well, let's recap a couple of things she said really quick. That's really important. Number one, the key to understanding the church's teaching in terms of uh uh, conception is that there are two aspects, love and life, and they have to be present, okay, uh, when uh, the marital act happens, and the, you can't thwart one or the other. So in vitro fertilization, for example, uh, destroys that love aspect, that unitive aspect of sexuality, and also contraception distors or uh, blocks or prevents that life act aspect of it. And so we can't act against either one of those. So it really, the church's teaching is as simple as you can get, love and life. You know, they belong together. And that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, that every um, act of intimacy has to be fully and completely unitive or loving. Uh, maybe you're not completely in the mood. <laughs> or uh, it doesn't mean that every act has to be life-giving. But the thing is, we can't act against those. Okay, so that's really where contraception comes in, that uh, that's an act against that. It's, it's performing the act while uh, losing one of those two goods. And uh, the other thing, too, uh, I, boy, listening to her defense of uh, contraception and NFP, um, you know, her critique, I should say, uh, it was like listening to a master violinist. There's so many nuances she threw in there. I just want to tease out a couple uh, notice how she she couched it as environmental, as natural. Uh, you know, this is playing on a lot of the themes that we hear out there. You know, the whole move for organic food and health. And there's probably nothing more unhealthy <laughs> than artificial contraception. Uh, but there's nothing more healthy than uh, natural family planning. So, uh, you know, you can show that it's uh, it's good. It, it promotes uh, lasting marriages. Uh, it promotes communication between the spouses. Uh, it means that, you know, the rearing of children becomes central in that relationship. That's a good. And also, and she pointed out that one of the biggest fears out there amongst youth is divorce because many of them, grow up in broken homes because the divorce rate is so high, largely because of contraception. And so, uh, you know, that makes a very strong apology for NFP, for the church's teaching, because it's a solution to the problem. You know, it's it, if you take sexuality seriously and uh, NFP, you know, seriously, that's going to relieve them of that, that fear, that burden that they carry around uh, about cons concerning divorce and remarriage. Because she's right. No one enters into divorce thinking uh, it's not going to work. It's going to be a failure. Um, 
I think a vast majority of people uh, who are hoping for the best. You know, they want a lasting marriage. So uh, that's a very, very strong apology. And boy, there's so many other details that you could tease out, even though, unfortunately, we only had two segments with Dr. Smith. Uh, I recommend those. Go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org, those who are into apologetics. Listen to those two segments again, and especially the second segment. And uh, you can hear all sorts of awesome themes that she weaves into her uh, explanation that I think would, uh, I think most secular people would gravitate towards that would sound right to them, you know. So let me give you some websites. Uh, first, One More Soul. That's all one word, onemoresoul.com. I believe that is the website where you can get a lot of Dr. Smith's material, articles, things like that. She also mentioned another website, and I have it here. It's Natural Womanhood, all one word, naturalwomanhood.org. And I haven't had a chance to check it out, but if Dr. Smith, <laughs> uh, she gives a thumbs up to it, it's got to be good. And I think that approaches the whole issue of sexuality, contraception, from an, uh, a natural, like organic viewpoint. You know, something, again, one of those things that, especially for those living in California, you know, everybody's into health. So, uh, you know, that's a, a great avenue to share the church's teaching with. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to other things. Uh, last Wednesday, August 21st, I did a live broadcast with my buddies uh, John DeRosa of ClassicalTheism.com and also Pat Flynn of the Pat Flynn Show, uh, ChroniclesOfStrength.com. And uh, we did a YouTube special. And uh, unfortunately, there was a technical snafu. Uh, <laughs> lost. <laughs> Some of the people didn't migrate over to the new URL, unfortunately. So I saw people waiting out there, waiting for the show to start while the show was going on. So my apologies if you are among the abandoned but nevertheless, uh, had a really good show. I always learn a lot from those two. They're just incredibly knowledgeable people. And uh, But we, we had a question during the show, and I have a feeling uh, that it's one of the people here at the YouTube chat who was attending. Actually, I mean, all the questions were great. Don't get me wrong. But uh, one person said, you know, all this information is great, but I'm just starting out. I can't learn all this stuff. You know, uh, what... Uh, Basically, what do I do? And I've been thinking about that question over the last couple of days because I realized that you turn into hands-on apologetics because you want to learn how to do the faith. And we have great segments here. Uh, you know, some of the, the movers and shakers in Catholic apologetics and beyond have come on the show and uh, downloaded some really, really uh, high quality and sometimes pretty steep intellectually speaking uh, uh, defenses of the faith. And uh, for those who are just starting out, you know, what do you do uh, if you can't be like uh, Dr. Smith, who knows everything, it seems like everything there is about this subject, or, uh, you know, uh, or uh, Ken Hensley uh, that we had yesterday about uh, going through how the atheistic worldview doesn't fit our experience, or, or you know, uh, John Martinoni or all these other people, what do you do? Well, I wanted to take the last couple of minutes of the program to kind of give you instruction because, look, we're all, we're all called to explain, defend the faith. We're all called to give an explanation for the hope that's in us. And so and the, ch the, the, the church is so big, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, theologically speaking, it's so intricate, so many doctrines, so many teachings, so many practices, plus 2,000 years of church history to defend. You know, if that weren't enough, plus philosophy and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, just looking at the scope of apologetics, it can be so overwhelming. If you're just starting out, you love the faith, you love Jesus, you you are uh, maybe being uh, uh, hounded by objections or, or something like that. What do you do? Well, here's some very basic tips. Uh, Terry Barber loves to give talking points, you know, uh, things to do. Well, here's some things to do for you. First, you need to pick an area of the faith that interests you. Okay, that's your first step. Take it up in prayer. Let God put his finger on something that interests you. Maybe, maybe you're just fascinating about uh, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. Or maybe you're interested about the macular conception. Or perhaps the communion of saints. Or, you know, uh, baptism. Or something like that. Uh, pick an area that interests you that 
for, you know, God put his finger and you just can't seem to get enough of. That's the first point, okay? Second step is what you want to do is find out what the church teaches on that one issue, okay? Not on everything, just that one issue. And, of course, the place to go is the Catechism of the Catholic Church because Catechism, you know, it will give you early father citations. It will give you scripture. It's just a great starting point. There's also other books you can go to as well. Uh, but you want to stick with church teaching. You want to find out exactly what the church teaches about, whatever issue it is, and just keep learning. You know, catechize yourself very well on that subject so that it gets to the point that if you look at the catechism or you look up a Catholic Encyclopedia article or you, you read articles about it, uh, it's pretty much just repeating what you already know. That's how you know you're done with step one. So if you're really fascinating by the Macula conception, what it is, you got to learn what's the definition, uh, look it up in the catechism, look it up in the, the papal document that defines it, stuff like that. Okay, so once you drill down on that and you know what the church teaches, the next thing you need to do is learn what anti-Catholics object about it. What are the common objections? And that's very easy to do. You could go to sites like, uh, go on the forums at catholic.com. That's Catholic Answers Forums. Uh, you can get books about the subject. There's tons of books out there on Mary. Uh, a lot of them are question, answer, objection, answer formats. Um, you know, I have a book, Making Sense of Mary, that, that might be helpful. But you probably want something a little bit uh, more remedial, you know, question, answer, that type of stuff. Uh, start there. Learn what are the typical objections against, say, the Immaculate Conception or whatever interests you. Okay? And learn the answers. Okay? Not, learn what the objections are and how it's typically answered. Um, and like I said, there's just so many different ways you can do that today. Uh, you're really blessed for those living now. It's, it's 20 years from ago, it didn't exist. Now we got Catholic Radio, we got Internet. There's tons of ways to do this. And you could do it pretty quickly, too. So learn church teaching, number one. Well, pick a subject, number one. Learn what the church teaches, number two. Number three, learn typical objections, okay? Now, uh, number four, test it out on your friends. Get comfortable talking about it. You know, bring up the macular conception in conversations. Say, hey, do you ever wonder, you know, why... Uh, <laughs> You know, why uh, the church teaches that Mary doesn't have the stain of original sin. You know, get used to talking about it. And then you're set to go. Once you do that, you can go out and talk about the Immaculate Conception competently. Now, you might say, yeah, but that's just one subject and there's so many different objections. Well, you know what you do is when you talk to someone, try to bring the, the conversation to the subject you know. And then, you know, start Pick another subject and start drilling down on that. Then you'll have two subjects you can put all your conversations drawing to that particular point. And that way, you know, before you know it, you know five, six, seven things you could talk about, and it gets easier and easier to dialogue. So that's my handy tips for those who are beginning newbies in apologetics. Uh, coming up next week, we have a great lineup. We have Bruce Sullivan, Matt Swaim, Jeff Kassab, Mar John Martinoni, and Jimmy Aiken coming into the dojo. And uh, that's it for today, folks. Yes, uh, it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center, turn off the dojo lights. And uh, coming up next, high-impact Catholic talk coming at you with the dynamic duo of Catholicism, the Terry and Jesse Show. And uh, I hope everybody has a blessed weekend. And God willing, we'll be back again next week to do this thing that we call hands-on apologetics. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.